Wow, here we are again, Brother Peter, with tidbits from the Word. What what does the book of Revelations actually teach? What is the book of Revelation? People ask that question who have not got into it. Who have you know it's amazing today that there are people that will spend thousands of dollars on comic books? They know everything about comic books and who's who and what's what and where and when it started and when it ended and all of that stuff. You don't know one thing, one not one thing about the Bible. This is God's book. This is the oldest book in the world. This book has been written since the foundation of the world. Our best record that, that begins in it is Adam and Eve were made by God. God made man in his own image. And then he gave man a helpmate, a woman. He took that rib from the side of that man and made that helpmate. What did that mean? God had a, a, a very, very good explanation for you and I that we could see. This Out of this rib, our side, he gave us a woman to stand beside us. And that woman is as much of us as we are. And if men would treat their wife as they do themselves, or even better, he would always have that outside rib standing beside him. I married in 1963. And about two, two and a half years ago, my wife went to heaven before me. But she was my companion. She stood beside me. She never forsook me. Back in the days when I was an alcoholic, a full-fledged alcoholic, a full-fledged cusser, a rambler, a uh, very, very wicked, wicked man, broke my marriage vows, did things that a man should never, ever do. And, and God saw fit to save me from that life and to make me a whole person in God, to learn how to respect that woman God gave me from my side and how that she was my better half. She was the better part of Peter Hutchins. She was the better part of me. She was the perfect wife, the perfect mother, the perfect woman. The, the woman who knew how to give herself as a part of the man, a rib, back to the man, and be that rib that was taken, given back. I probably had, there are good women out there, many, 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 millions of good women out there. For me, none could surpass the woman that I had. She was the perfect woman for me. She gave herself to me 100%. She cleaned the house. She kept the house immaculate. She cooked the meals. She actually went out and worked and made money and put it in the same kitty that my money was in and never ever one time said, this is my money. It was always ours. Never one time did I ever have a kick against me from that woman. Even when I was the most wicked man there ever was. She did give me an ultimatum one time. I was out, I was married, yet I was with another woman. And she walked in that bedroom and said to me, I tell you what. If you're not home in 20 minutes, don't ever come back to the house again. I'll tell you what I did. I got up out of that situation. I came home. Never, ever got in that situation again. Never, ever. And this woman was willing to take me as, I, as wicked as I was, as unclean as I was, and she was willing to take me back and say, look, you just come on home and all the past is going to be the past. Do you know 
that I lived with her another 40 something years or so and not one time in all of those years did she ever throw my past up not one time not ever and my past was wicked it was vile it was the devil himself had crept into this body and and I had turned myself over to him being a full-fledged alcoholic a womanizer a one that would go with a woman that she would have me and and that was me and then God came on the scene 1972 and said your numbers up and I called on the Lord I said Lord I'm a sinner forgive me of my sin come in my heart and save my soul all ALL of my past was erased eradicated gone as if it had never happened yes do you have memories yes do you have nightmares about the way you were in those days yes I do and how I had fallen from grace the grace of God is well you can't fall out of the grace of God he was always there it was always there all I had to do was grasp it and say God forgive me and that's what I did November 5th 1972 3 o'clock in the morning I said Lord Jesus I am a sinner forgive me of my sin I had been drunk for a week solid I was drunk then I said Lord forgive me I'm a sinner come in my heart and save my soul I was dead sober and I've been dead sober ever since 3 o'clock in the morning November 5th 1972 and been clean and God cleaned me up and made me his child oh I had some rough edges and God had to work those off from me but my wife and I both at the same time said God and I came home and told her she prayed to pray Lord forgive me I'm a sinner come in my heart and save my soul we went down to the church and got baptized in the water saying what is baptism it's called the death the burial and the resurrection when that preacher puts you under the water buries you in the death of the old person and raises you up as a new person that's a likeness of something you do we did that so that we could come out of that water saying listen I have surrendered my life to God I have surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ to follow him the rest of the days of this human body and I have followed him from then, then to now God has used me in many 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 ways uh, not prominent in the sense that I was recognized as a preacher is uh, hey that's a great preacher over there uh, that's a great preacher over there no I've been used in a small way I've been a street preacher I've won uh, hundreds of people to the Lord and my daily routine is God God allowed me to write this track in this track I have given thousands and thousands and thousands of them out this track says God's Word the Bible says uh, we can know and uh, uh, we can know uh, here's how for all have sinned and come show the glory of God every one of us has sinned and come show the glory of God now you may be you may have lived a powder puff life and you may have left to go to school every morning in a suit you may still be in a suit you still may be in a suite of offices you still may be a very wealthy man wearing a, a a larger suit than you wore when you was a child but you look the same in the sense of the word the question is is what how are you suited inside what kind of suit do you have on inside do you have a suit of the world inside or do you have a suit of God inside God's word is very clear to all mankind that all mankind is born in a sinful body and they are sinners and, but the righteousness of God everyone has fallen short of the standard of God from the day he's born until he says 
Jesus, or God, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin, give me my heart, save me soul. What is the wages of sin? Romans, in the Bible, is a book called Romans. It was written by Paul to you and I. And in Romans 6 and 23, he said that the wages of sin is death. What does wages? What is wages? Wages is payment. So if we die without asking Jesus Christ into our heart, the payment for dying in that condition is eternal death. That means you are separated from God forever, never having the opportunity again to ask Him, forgive you of your sin, come in your heart. But you know God commended His love toward us that while we're yet in that sin, while we're yet degraded, while we're yet far away from God, Romans 5 and 8 says that God commended His love toward us, that He died on the cross for you and I, yet while we were the sinners. Hardly would a man even give his finger for another person. If somebody said, if you give your finger, that man right there won't die. And if you don't give your finger, he's going to die. We would have a hard time making that decision. But Jesus laid his whole life down for you and I. God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he died for our sins. He's the one that did. He's the one that made the payment for you and I. Uh, and then the fourth thing is, it is a gift. He made the payment on the cross. He gave us a gift. What was that gift? It is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6 and 23. He gave us a gift of eternal life. You say, Brother Peter, you talked about you were the most miserable human being on earth. You were one of the most wicked people that ever walked on two feet, and I was. I was a cursor. I was a, a person that would threaten. If anybody came against me, I would threaten them with misery in their life. And that was me. But when God saved me, that all of that had to leave. And I became... What was that? That was a gift from God, His Son, Jesus Christ. It was Jesus who died on the cross for you and for me. And it is Jesus who gives us and gave me eternal life. I will live forever. I'm a poor specimen of somebody who ought to go to heaven. That's a fact. But God, it's in, it's in God's grace that he takes this old body and cleans it up and makes it something that to him is going to be worthy to be in heaven. Am I worthy? No, I'm not worthy through Jesus Christ that came and lived in me and lives in me now, makes me worthy. Salvation is possible only through Jesus, God's Son. So if you believe that Jesus died for you and you receive Him as your Savior by saying, God, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. The Bible says, Whosoever, in Romans 10 and 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. You are a whosoever. I am a whosoever. We are all whosoevers. If you desire to fellowship with the God that desires to fellowship with you, you must make the difference by asking Him. God never intended salvation to be difficult. It's not something you can work and get. It's something you have to ask for by forgiveness, but you can't work and get it. You can say, well, I'm going to turn a new leaf. I hear that all the time. I'm going to be good from now on. I'm going to quit this. I'm going to quit that. I'm going to be good from now on. You can't do it. In this flesh, you can't do it. This flesh is wicked. The only way you can control the wickedness of this flesh is to get God inside of you and have Him control your flesh from the inside and say, hey, Peter, that is not your pen. You don't take it home with you. That's called stealing. Wow. Back before I got saved, anything I could pick up in my hand was mine. No matter what it was, if I could pick it up and walk away and nobody saw me, it was mine. And that was the way it was. 
and that's the way it still is in the world today. You can come home and see things gone out of your yard all the time. I wonder where my prayer air compressor went. Well, somebody said nobody's looking. It's going to be mine. And they loaded it in their trunk and drove off with it. Well, that was this guy right here. Years and years ago, back before 1972, that was this guy. And it, God changed me. He showed me. That's not right. That's not proper. You don't do this kind of thing. So do you believe in Jesus? I'm asking you the question right now. You who are watching this, you're watching it right now. You're watching me. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you want to know him today as your Savior? Just pray this simple prayer from your heart to God. And as God, I know that I am a sinner. Do you know you're a sinner? Say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I want Jesus to come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and save my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. That's what I prayed. 1972, November 5th, 3 o'clock in the morning. Changed my whole life instantly. Instantly. Never took a drink. After that, I went home, poured all the liquor down the drain. Poured all the beer down the drain. Never put another drop of liquor to my mouth again, ever. 100% deliverance. I was a full-fledged alcoholic. I drank liquor every single day. There wasn't a day I didn't drink liquor. And so, and God delivered me from that, never to take another drink. 100% delivery, instant. No DTs, no nothing. Done. It was done. So if you pray to receive him today as your Savior, welcome to the family of God. And that's how simple it is. Now find you a church. More than likely, if you can find a church that has a bus ministry, you find a church that the average devil peer person talks about it, saying, oh, that's that bunch of holier-than-thou people down there. And that's that bunch of people that believe it. God is God and that Jesus Christ it can come into your heart and save your soul. Yes, that's the church you want to join. That's the one you want to go to. And so let's get now into the book of Revelation. How is Revelation to be interpreted? I'm studying a Bible uh, called Salem Kirbin's Bible. And it's not really his Bible. It's the King James Version. And he puts the footnotes in it. That is, do the major events of Revelations chapter 6 through 19, what do they show? Now, the past events already fulfilled in the history of the Roman Empire of the first century with Nero being a picture and actually was for that period of time the Antichrist. And this is called the... Uh, the, the Pretrite or the past and this approach to the book of Revelation so you're approaching the book of Revelations to what was in the past now you're approaching it for a different thing next the events of the present age now you're approaching it for what's today what's happening today okay this age such as in the early uh Time, the pre-creation or the time of barbarians or the time of uh, people who uh, live uh, according to their hunger. People have always lived according to their hunger. I'm hungry. What, do I'm going, what am I going to do? Well, I don't have anything to eat. I, I was passing by and I saw a man that had a cow. Well, a cow is meat. So I'm going to take my club over there. I'm going to club that cow between the eyes. And we're going to drag him to the house. And the village is going to have a feast tonight from that man's cow. And that's how it was. Might made right. Now, we're in a present age right now. Where we're almost back to where if somebody stands in our way, we're going to club him and get him out of the way and step in his position. And this is, that was, back in the day, was barbaric. And up in this day right here, it's a barbaric act. And we see it every day. 
the early presentation, the barbarian invasions, the Dark Ages, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, for the United States was the World War One, World War Two, then we saw Vietnam. Uh, this is called the historical approach to learning how to go back and study the Bible and learn the Bible. All the things I just said are in our age. But as we study the Bible, we go back into the age of the people as they came all the way from Adam's race up through. How did Adam kill an animal and eat it? We don't know exactly, but more than likely, it was a club. And he clubbed him between the eyes and killed him and cooked him and ate him. And that was the way it was because he didn't have what we have. And so there are no events at all, rather general visions which uh, teach of no future uh, specific events, but which assert over and over merely the lesson that eventually God will win over Satan in every sphere of life. This is the call the topical. Now this is the topical or the critical approach. And uh, psychologically approaching this thing. So called because God is over Satan lesson is repeated in the cycles of the chapters of Revelation. Now, God is the winner. The end of the book of Revelation, God is the winner. Now, no events at all in the book uh, being merely a long allegory or a picture story with hidden themes or philosophically, uh, philosophically and, uh, and love. It discusses under the external, less important words of the book. This is called the allegorical or the historical approach. You can approach the book of Revelation as true fact. Bam, it's fact. Or you can uh, approach it as a mythical book, which is not a mythical book. It is a factual book. Now, only human uh, guesses of what would happen to Nero, Rome, and new religion as time went on. This is called the liberal or the modernistic approach. Now, we, we are living in that liberal age again. We are living in a modernistic approach today to Jesus, and there's no other way to Jesus except through the Bible. What the Bible says, calling on Him as your Lord and Savior. Events still in the future, which will occur in the seven years coming tribulation, period called Daniel's 70th week. And in Daniel's 70th weeks, Daniel 9:27, we see the rapture will occur. We see the Antichrist will be revealed and he will become a world leader. So we are looking forward from right now to seeing a man become the world leader one day. Not just the United States, but he will rule the world. And, and uh, God will pour out judgment upon the earth, which will culminate in the destruction of the Antichrist in the armies of Armageddon and that is at the revelation of Christ. Revelation 19, verse 11 and 20 through 22. Two. At the end of the seven years, and listed in the book of Joel and in the book of Zechariah, you will see 12 to 14, Zechariah 12 to 14, Isaiah 63, Matthew 24 to 25, this is the futuristic approach. That is approaching the future and the Word of God 
from what these verses tell you and say to you. They explain to you. There are some reasons why the futuristic approach uh, to Revelations is correct. And one of the reasons is, is the best of Revelations, 11 through 19, is the same as Daniel's fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7, which is an important thing to see, and um, uh, which is that yet the future, the final kingdom, uh, which is destroyed just prior to the establishment of the kingdom of heaven. The final earthly kingdom. And then we have the kingdom of heaven. Number two in that same futuristic thing is that five times we see specifications of the book of Revelations 11 and 2, 11 and 3, 12, 6 through 14, chapter 13 and verse 5. Upon the study, harmonizing, that means putting it directly. It's like listening to a tune that harmonizes straight through without breaking perfectly with the time, specifications, and the events which surround. And this is yet to be in the future. The seven-year period known as Daniel's 70th week. Daniel 9, 27, 8, and 25, 12, and 7. It is uh, ridified three times in the book of Daniel that it, this is going to happen and it's going to happen as it is prophesied. Now what is a futuristic approach to the apocalypse? The only one uh, counter-liberal, allegorical, uh, the, the preacher history of the and tropical, uh, which harmonizes with Daniel 9.24, Daniel 26.27, Daniel 7.19-27, Daniel 8.23-20, Matthew 24 and 25, uh, Thessalonians, Jeremiah, Romans 11.25, John 5 and 20, Zechariah 12.9-14, Jeremiah 23.5-8. Wow. We, are, we see the unified, uh, categorical program in the Bible. It is listed 1 through 10, just as clear as a bell in, in that. What is a futuristic approach? It is only one that accomplishes the purpose in, uh, in Revelations 1-1. Uh, to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Now, Jesus Christ lives in eternity. So the only thing that is time is what is on earth. And he said this must shortly come to pass. Well, it's still coming to pass since it was written. And uh, what is the illiberal approach? That denies this ability... Uh, that the allegorical uh, allegorizes away the things revealed. Uh, see, they, they pre-treat the allegation they, they, that's allegated to us that which is to be the future and that which was the past. The historical approach presents the items so valid that they cannot be identified even after they are complete and the topical sees only general trends rather than future trends. So we live in a trendly earth. It's, everything is trends. They go on as trends. And they, the futuristic approach does not resort to unwarranted allegations of the symbol or the symbolic as well as the literal uh, details of the apocalypse as the historical and topical views do. So there are several views of what this scripture says, but there's only one real answer. The futuristic view yields a premillennial coming of Christ 
while the topical views uh, uh, are kind of silic and they, the pattern is placed in Revelation 20 before Revelation 19 logically leads to uh, I-millennialism. That means you don't believe in the millennial reign. And we as Christians following the Lord Jesus Christ believe in the millennial reign. Well, our time, by the way, is the fastest 30 minutes of my life has come and gone. And we will see you next time. Right. Bye-bye.